Well, if I asked you guys to tell me what victory looks like, what would you picture? Maybe you thought of the rider victory yesterday, right? <laughs> Sorry, if there's no, anyone who's not a Riders fan, I apologize. Maybe you thought of the Olympics that are upcoming, right? And in their victory is three medalists, first, second, and third. They win the victory, and the others don't win the victory. Maybe you thought of a war when one country goes and takes up arms against, <clears throat> excuse me, another country and defeats them. Maybe you thought of a debate where one person might uh, present their point of view and one point of view prevails and the other is declared the loser and the other the winner. Maybe you like to play board games with your family or your friends and when you play a board game, the victor is the one who achieves the objective of the game before everyone else gets there. Usually you only win bragging rights in those cases, but it's still fun. Or maybe you thought of a video game where you achieve the objective of the game and therefore you declared victory over the game. Maybe some of you thought of the struggle to get a law passed or a regulation changed and victory is managing to convince people to vote for your idea and to defeat those who would vote against it. Sometimes we think of victory in the context of personal struggles, maybe an illness or an undesirable habit. And if a person is treated for the illness and survives, they win the victory. Or if they manage to overcome the habit, they live a better, healthier life. Maybe you had in your mind the picture of a courtroom where two parties present arguments before a judge and the judge decides which side has the most merit and one side wins in court and the other loses. Victory is often declared where there is a winner and often there is something or someone, therefore, that loses. Now, winning is often a good feeling. Going back to your sports example, you likely know if you're a sport fan of any kind, if somebody, uh, if your sports team wins, it gives you an emotional lift for the day, doesn't it? And if they lose, it can kind of make you feel a little bit depressed for the rest of the day. And the crazy thing is that nothing else in your life changes, no matter what happens with that sports team, but still it can affect the way you feel. We're talking about victory because, as I mentioned when we talked to the children, we're still exploring the little letter of 1 John in our New Testaments. And we've reached chapter 5 now, so we're near to the end of the letter. If you've been with us for the past few weeks, this will just be recap, but if you haven't, we need to catch up on a few things. But there are themes that have surfaced often throughout the letter of 1 John. It was written by an elder who cares for this community. And the ideas in this letter have been compared to almost like a symphony where a melody introduced by the strings fades away as the music moves on, but then it reappears from the woodwinds a few bars later. One of the melodies throughout this letter is love, the love of God, the love we have for one another, and it even says that God is love. Another melody that appears is the testimony or witness about Jesus, particularly about the cross of Jesus and the power of his resurrection. Another melody that surfaces time and again is the reassurance that we are in fact the children of God when we know Jesus. And many of those themes were present in our reading today from 1 John at chapter 5. But here the author introduces a new word. It can be translated overcome, defeat, conquer, win out, and I use the word victory. It can also be translated victory and victorious. And there, the connection between these words is a lot clearer in Greek, so that's why they can be used for one another. It says, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. And that word overcome there is the word I've been using, victory. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Now this little letter was written primarily to encourage a hurting community. A community that had experienced a split. A community that has had some of the people whom they worshipped with and ate with and prayed with. They've left the fellowship. And that left those who remained behind confused, nervous, and hurting. Maybe even fearful. Perhaps they doubted whether or not they really knew Jesus. 
Perhaps they doubted whether or not they really were the children of God. Perhaps they'd been told by those who left them behind that they were not real Christians or that they'd missed the narrow road and they were now outside the community of true followers of Jesus. So isn't it interesting that it was to the people who had been left behind, I've wondered if it felt a little bit like a bad breakup. The ones who feel the sting of rejection and the judgment of not being good enough, the elder writes these words that they are victorious, that they have defeated something, that they have overcome. You are the victorious ones, he said. You are the overcomers and the conquerors. He writes this to these people who are unsure and hurting, but this elder says, you are on the winning team. How can that be? Well, the elder who wrote the letter of First John opened with his own testimony. He talked about the things that he saw and heard and witnessed in Jesus. And he testifies about this so that his listeners would be reminded of those things they had already been told, things they already believed in, that Jesus lived, that he really lived, that he lived in a body, that he walked this earth that he really went to the cross and he really was raised from the dead. As one writer puts it, one cannot know Jesus, the risen and reigning Lord, without reckoning with the incarnation and the flesh and bones of Jesus. However, there are many in our world, both in our world today and in the ancient world, who would prefer it if we could just bypass the flesh and bones of Jesus. The temptation to claim the glory of God without the cross is strong. There have always been people who see the cross of Jesus not as a means of grace, but as a curse to be denied or perhaps explained away. People who want some way out of the idea that their Savior was indeed hung on a cross. In fact, that is what many scholars believe characterize this group of people that we've talked about, the ones who split off from this worshiping community, that they left because they either found or they invented a system of religious observation where Jesus was not really a human being, and so they could find the glory of God without the embarrassment or defeat of the cross. But the people who really absorb the message of those first witnesses of Jesus the ones who actually understood the message of the gospel the best, the ones who believe the original story that has always been the witness of the apostles of Jesus, they were the ones who were left behind. They were the ones who remained in this community after this painful split. And that's precisely why the author of 1 John can confidently tell his hearers they were victorious. They were on the winning team. Because his definition of success is different than the world's definition of success. And in fact, if you believe the gospel or the good news is that which Paul writes about in 1 Corinthians 15, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, it makes perfect sense that our sense of victory or overcoming is different. Jesus had a different definition of success or victory or what it means to overcome than the rest of the world has. In the Gospel of John, Jesus tells his disciples the following. He says to them in John chapter 16, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. And that word there, I have overcome the world, that is the same word used here in 1 John chapter 5. Jesus tells his disciples to have courage because he has won the victory over or conquered the world. But you know he tells his disciples this right before he went to the cross. In fact, the very verse before that one in John chapter 16 is this, a time is coming and in fact has come when you will be scattered, each to your own home. You will leave me all alone, and yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. So Jesus tells his disciples in no uncertain terms, they're going to be scattered. 
They're going to abandon Jesus in his moment of need. Jesus is going to be arrested before their very eyes, and his words are going to come true. The disciples will scatter. Their courage is going to fail them. They're going to run for cover while Jesus is arrested and tried and then led away to be crucified. And everyone who followed Jesus, those who loved him and had bet their lives on following him, they watched in horror as they lost everything when Jesus was beaten cruelly and nailed to a cross. The most faithful among them hung along long enough to be traumatized by watching everything that happened to their Lord and teacher and friend. And then they watched when he was buried in a tomb. If anyone knows what it feels like to lose, it's the disciples of Jesus. Not one of them expected to find an empty tomb on that first Easter morning. And the faithful women who were there, as incredible as their faith and devotion to Jesus was, they were there expecting to anoint a dead body. I once preached a sermon entitled, Easter is for Losers, for that very reason, because every single follower of Jesus lost. They were let down. They found their world collapsing around them. They felt the shattering of their faith. They lost everything they held dearest. And for a time, it warped their belief in a God who was good and who loved them. And not too long before that happened, Jesus has the audacity to say to his followers, have courage, take heart, I have conquered the world. Victory, overcoming, conquering, those were not words the disciples would have used to describe their experience when they saw Jesus go to the cross. And as they dealt with their own failure of nerve and the letdown of their faith at the very same time, and yet Jesus says to them, that is the moment of victory. On the cross, Jesus overcame the world. So those who follow Jesus, those who hold on to faith in Christ and him crucified, the idea of what victory means, of what it means to win and be successful is different. And this redefinition of success and victory, it forever shaped the followers of Jesus who truly experienced it. It shaped the Apostle Paul, who was once believed that victory was defined by his religious zeal. He was so convinced that he knew uh, what the right religion was and that Christians were wrong that he proved it by hunting down and even approving of the killing of followers of Jesus because he believed he was right and they were wrong and victory meant you went after those who were wrong. But once Jesus got a hold of him, Paul sees success differently When he writes to the church in Corinth, he refuses to brag to them about who he baptized because he doesn't want to play their power games. Paul refuses to take sides and say who he thinks is right when he wrote to the house churches in Rome. In fact, in Rome, he identifies the groups into the strong and the weak, and he even identifies with the weak for a time. He wants to be all things to all people, he says. Whenever Paul could, he gave away power. In fact, his view of a victory of what it looks like, what an enslaver should do with a slave who was also a Christian, it wasn't shaped by victory in the eyes of the world. What he envisioned they could do is join hands and live together as brothers in Christ, that they could worship God together. That's the point of the little letter of Philemon. And Paul writes about trouble and hardship and persecution and famine and nakedness and danger and the possibility of facing the sword, all of which, by the way, he himself faced when he spread the gospel of Jesus the Messiah to the ends of the earth. And then he can write about all those things and he talks about the things he experienced and the things the people he was writing to had experienced. And he says, for your sake we face death all day long. He says, we are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. And then in the very next breath, he utters these words, no, in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And in 1 John, the elder who writes with the voice of one who witnessed Jesus in the flesh, he reassures this hurting, confused community that 
to tell them that although it feels as though they are losing everything, including their claim as children of God, they are the ones who have the victory. They are the ones who clung to their faith in Jesus that they had believed from day one. They knew the love of God which made them the children of God, and they were exhorted to love one another as God had loved them. And this, just this, the fact that they were still there, that they were still loving one another, that they were still clinging, however tenuously, to their faith that Jesus really walked the earth, that he really went to the cross, that he really was raised from the dead, that is victory. One author writes this, Truly Christian faith conquers the world, not by military might or doctrinal arguments or by coercion, but by love. Christians believe in the Son of God, who rather than shedding the blood of others to prove he was the Messiah, allowed his own blood to be shed. God's children triumph not by inflicting suffering on others or by avoiding pain at all costs, but by allowing God to work within and through them even in their suffering. The church triumphs over false teaching not by force or argument, but because of and through the suffering love of the crucified Messiah, This is the truth to which the Holy Spirit testifies. God's Son was broken for us. This is the faith that overcomes the world. God's love brings life even out of brokenness and death. This is the victory to which we are called, loving God's children and living our faith in the crucified and risen Son of God. There's a powerful song. It's called Citizens. It's written by a man named John Guerrera. And the entire song is quite convicting to listen to because it lives in this tension between the promises of God that we read in scripture to care for people who are suffering and the truth that people who are Christians often prefer to make friends with the powerful. And we can conflate things like patriotism and xenophobia with faith in Jesus Christ. Here are some of the lyrics of the song. There's a wolf who is ranting All the sheep they are clapping, promising power and protection, claiming the Christ who was killed, killed by a common consensus, everyone screaming Barabbas, trading their God for a hero, forfeiting heaven for Rome. And the final verse of the song is this, power has several prizes, handcuffs can come in all sizes, love has a million disguises, but winning is simply not won. How often do we trade God and the teachings of scripture for a hero? How often do we seek out Rome instead of heaven? More often perhaps than we care to admit. In this letter of 1 John, it puts so much emphasis on love, loving God, loving one another. God is love. In fact, at a children's story recently, we took time to list these things. So I brought it back out for you to see today of what it looks like when you feel loved, of the things that you have done to love other people in your lives. And as I look at this list, I do not see I won an argument or I won a victory over that person anywhere to show love. Winning is simply not love. Victory has a different meaning when it comes to our faith. One author puts it this way, victory over the world does not require spiritual heroics or ascetic denial. Victory is found through faith in what Jesus is and has done. Nothing else is needed. And my friends, I know the world is difficult and it looks bleak some days, maybe even most days. Jesus said it and he said it well, in this world you will have trouble. We feel this keenly. So much of the world is about winning at all costs. Sometimes it feels like we've lost too often or too much. And it's so discouraging when we don't get the jobs we want or we look at our bank balance or we feel the crunch of higher prices and fewer resources or when our relationships are difficult or when we face that uncertain medical diagnosis or when the church we love feels like it's shrinking or when people in the helping sector dismiss our efforts because we're Christians. But victory doesn't always look the way the world thinks it should. 
We are victorious when we hold on to the faith that we believed, when we cling to the cross of Christ, when despite everything that pushes us to despair, we find our hope in nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And the fact that you are here this morning, even though there are a thousand things that might call you away, that you can still give to God's work when you can, that you can whisper a prayer to Jesus, that you can cook for or feed someone because of your faith, that you could still lament or protest the way that God's will is not yet come on earth as it is in heaven, or you pay attention to God's created world, or that you still learn or rest or encourage someone, that you can still sing a song or mutter a Bible verse or embrace a friend in church, even the smallest shred of faith in Jesus Christ is a victory. No, the Apostle Paul reassures us, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced, he says, that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing separates us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is what victory looks like. Would you bow with me in a word of prayer? God, who is called love, we are so steeped in this world we are so shaped by it. Sometimes we just want to win at all costs. We figure we need to be victorious in the ways and means this world is. But we see a different kind of victory in the way that God so loved the world when we see the way that Jesus loved us, including going to the cross. And so we pray that you would help us to redefine success and victory so that we can be confident and take heart that you have overcome the world and that nothing in all creation can separate us from your love. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As you go into the world this week, go to love one another because God is love. Proclaim God's salvation to every generation. Remain in Christ like the branches of a vine and draw your life from him. And now by the love of God the Father, revealed to us in God the Son, through the power and the presence of God's Holy Spirit, dwell within us today and forever. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.